Professor Pedro Ferreira from the University of Oxford. Um, he's one of the uh, uh, leading experts in uh, theories beyond uh, the standard cosmological model. And we're very happy that he accepted the invitation to give the set of lectures for us uh, uh, exactly about this topic. So everything you want to ask about beyond Lambda CDM, uh, you, this is the opportunity. So Pedro, without further ado, thank you very much for joining us and uh, please take the floor. Okay, um, Rogério, thank you so much for, for inviting me to, to do this. I, I think this is the second time I'm in, I'm in Brazil in the last uh, month. And uh, these, as everyone says, these are strange circumstances. Uh, I've, uh, I've prepared a series of lectures and I think the philosophy of the lectures that I'm gonna pre present is uh, when, when people talk about Beyond Lambda CDM, it's on the one hand, it's typically a set of special topics that lie on the edge of a lot of what is being done in cosmology. On the other hand, um, it's become quite integral to the science cases for the big missions. And so what I thought I would do is um, present a series of different aspects of Beyond Lambda CDM with a particular focus on gravity. Um, and I will, I will get into that in the next few minutes. Um, and all the different things that people talk about but never go into detail, I will go into a little bit more detail. Um, so let me start by sharing the screen. I've pre pre prepared a few uh, slides, which you've probably seen already. Not yet, but ah, yes, yes. Okay, all right. So <laughs> I'm gonna start with um, basically just very quickly discussing what we mean by Beyond Lambda CDM. And, and I've on my first transparency, I've just put my name down, my email, and um, and you can you can access my website there. Well, let's just quickly go into what we mean by Beyond Lambda CDM. And uh, before we go into what is Beyond Lambda CDM, I'm probably going to recap why we believe Lambda, Lambda CDM so well. And I think this is a phenomenal picture, right? As you know, this is the angular power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. This is the temperature. And so on the x-axis, we have the multipoles. And on the y-axis, we have the amplitude. This is the temperature temperature um, power spectrum. And what we have here is the blue line is the theory of general relativity in an isotropic, homogeneous and isotropic background in a universe with a cosmological constant, some dark matter, some baryons and some neutrinos. And um, the red dots are, is the data. And this is the data from the Planck 2018 paper. And the data is, uh, I mean, it's so good that we, the, 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 the data has error bars and the error bars seem to be buried in the line thickness of the theory. Below that, we have the cross correlation between the temperature and the E polarization. And again, this is remarkable. The error bars are minuscule compared to, to, uh, to the theory. Now, uh, this, this has happened in our lifetime, in my lifetime. I remember when there was none of this. And so it's, it's quite an amazing thing to see, but it is also why we believe Lambda CDM so well. Another manifestation of this is when we look at the power spectrum of, of, of um, the matter distribution. And typically we try and measure this by looking at galaxies. On the x-axis, we have the, inver we, the inverse wavelength, so the wave number. So he, on the left, we have large wavelengths. On the right, we have small wavelengths, so large scale, small scales. And on the y-axis, we have the amplitude of clustering. And again, we have lambda CDM is this line and lying on this line are different measurements from different, uh, uh, from different um, uh, surveys uh, of, of, um, and the deconvolved temperature of uh, what the power spectrum of the matter distribution should look like. And again, it's a remarkable fit and it's just getting better and better. So I think these are the really the reasons why we believe Lambda CDM so, you know, with, with such conviction. But what do we mean by Lambda CDM? And we, but we mean by Lambda CDM that we take the Einstein field equations, which we have here. This is the Einstein tensor. It's sourced by the energy momentum tensor and the energy momentum tensor contains some radiation, some baryons, some dark matter, some neutrinos. 
And we have to include a term which is the cosmological constants, which is this lambda multiplied by the metric. And if we assume homogeneity and isotropy, then that means that we assume a particular form for the metric. The metric, which was, uh, which is basically 10 functions of space and time, reduces to one function of time, which is the scale factor over here, and the scale factor obeys the Friedman equations. And so the Friedman equations, what we have here is a dot over a squared is dri driven by the energy density of the universe plus the cosmological constant. And so this is, in a nutshell, what lambda CDM is. Pedro, so what do we Pedro, can you go full screen? People are asking for you to go full screen. Can I go? I thought I was full screen. Full screen. Is this better? Um, not seeing it yet full screen. What are you seeing? I can still see, uh, wait. I've unshared, I'm gonna share again. How about now? How is full screen, thank you. Okay, very good. All right, so um, can you see my cursor? Yes. Very good. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm not too happy going full screen, to be honest, because it doesn't let me move forward. Oh, there it goes. All right. Um, so what do we mean by beyond lambda CDM? Well, beyond lambda CDM, we, we, we try to break one or more parts of the model of lambda CDM. And I've just listed them here, and I'm just going to go quickly through them. We can modify general relativity. We can say that we don't use Einstein's field equations, but we use something else. We can add an exotic form of matter. We can change this bit over here, which if you remember came from stress energy tensor. We can replace the cosmological constant by something else, a potential of some field, or we can violate homogeneity. In other words, not assume a metric like this. Let's see what that means in more detail. So for example, we can replace the cosmological constant by some energy density, for example, that of a scalar field, which I have here, and that scalar field has a kinetic term and has a potential energy. If the kinetic energy is completely subdominant, the energy density is dominated by the potential, en potential energy, and which is very similar to a cosmological constant. But it's not exactly a cosmological constant. It's not exactly a cosmological constant because we can go away and work out the equation of state of this, this, um, this fluid, and it's nothing more than dividing the pressure of this fluid by the energy density of the, future, the, the fluid. And it looks something like this. And this typically is different from minus one, which is what you would get if it was an exact cosmological constant. So beyond lambda CDM here means looking for this equation of state. So this is the simplest example of what is beyond lambda CDM. Now, this, this normally is, has been absorbed into lambda CDM. So often when people talk about lambda CDM, they're talking about um, quintessence as well. Um, another example of going beyond lambda CDM, lambda CDM, you model strictly in terms of a cosmological constant and cold dark matter. But what if you replace the dark matter, which is a P equals zero fluid, by something else, the coherent massive scalar field? And this again, scalar field comes into play. Scalar field that, that um, obeys the Klein-Gordon equation, you can solve it. And it turns out that you actually can solve it analytically and you find that the energy density of the scalar field goes in the large M limit as one over a cubed. So it decays exactly like dark matter, except it has a sound speed, which is not equal to zero. So that can introduce features. And there are other examples of these kinds of modifications to lambda CDM by modifying the dark matter sector. Another example is if you, for example, uh, drop the assumption of homogeneity. And over the years, they, the, these models come into popular, come into fa fashion and then fall out of fashion. Here, what I've written is I've written the metric for a model which is radially symmetric. It's known as the Lemaitre um, Tolman Bondi model. So your scale factor now depends on the temperature and the radius. And not only that, you, you have two scale factors. You have a scale factor in front of the radial part and you have another scale factor in front of the angular part. So it's not like the Friedman case uh, anymore. And what this is a, a particular, this is just a visualization of suppose that in some region of space you have an under density or you have a region of negative curvature which is spherically symmetric. And there's a whole literature on this which is um, uh, people come back to even though they keep on getting ruled out. So it's it's an interesting field of research which 
at the moment I don't think has great traction. Um, of course, I'm not going to talk about quite a lot of work trying to show that the universe doesn't have a cosmological constant, i.e. is not accelerating. There have been multiple reanalysis of the supernova results. There have been multiple uh, 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 looks at anomalies in the supernova result, anomalies in surveys of large scale structures. I think this is valid work. I am not going to get into this because each of these pieces, each of these pieces would have to be discussed in detail. I think there are flaws to all of them, but there are also strengths to all of them, but I'm not going to go into this. So what I'm really going to look at is I'm going to discuss beyond GR by focusing on gravity. And what I'm going to do and what I'm going to try and follow through is I'm going to uh, discuss why GR first, then I'm going to discuss why not GR, why would, why would we consider alternatives to, uh, to GR and what do these theories look like. I'm going to look at something which has really emerged over the last decade, which is the importance of gravitational screening, the fact that modifications to general relativity may, may a play a bigger or lesser role depending on the environment that you, you, you look at. And then I'm going to see how this plays itself out when we look at either large scale structure, large scale constraints and galaxies. I'm going to introduce what is possibly an exciting new way of doing this. OK, so I am going to exit full screen and I'm going to go to my next bit here. So. You. Pedro, if you don't mind, there are some questions in the chat. You want me to read it? Uh, sure. Yes. While well, I do this. Well, so, do this. Uh, so I, Reggie, yeah. can you read it or want me to read it? Um, are the signs on the line element correct? I, I let me see. It's probably the metric that you're using. <laughs> Yes, why wouldn't they be correct? Oh, sorry, I see. Before, you mean in front, in the Tolman Bondi part. Um, you're right, there should be a plus in front of the B squared. Um, what is gravitational screening? I will get to that in one of my lectures. Okay, very good. Um, let me then go to view full screen. Right, and I'm going to share screen for this. Can you see it now? You can see yes. it. Very good. All right. So I'm going to focus on gravity. And um, sorry, I'm going to focus on gravity. And the first thing I'm going to do is why do we believe in GR? There, there's a bunch of references on the first page. And I'm going to um, try and convince you that GR is really a fantastic theory. And I don't think that's going to take a lot of work. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, just quickly recap the history of general relativity. We all know what happened. We all know that Einstein over seven years got lost in the wilderness and he came back and he proposed the theory of relativity, which was based on this whole new mathematics that he really didn't know and was introduced to by his friend. Um, and he was able to formulate a geometrical theory of gravity. Uh, and the, the first success of that geometric theory of gravity is that it could explain the precession of perihelion of Mercury. Eddington went out and with uh, uh, his colleagues, they measured the, the eclipse. They found that it predicted the bending of light exactly as general relativity had said. This launched ge general relativity into this incredibly successful theory over 10, 10 years that there was this, this um, this epoch of what I call the low hanging fruit, where people could just calculate new things and they were wonderful. Schwarzschild could show what the metric was around a point mass. Friedman and Lemaitre could work out what was happening with an expansion of the universe. Einstein himself could predict gravitational waves. All these beautiful papers came out over a period of uh, uh, between 10 and 15 years after he had proposed uh, the general theory of relativity. Hubble measures the expansion of the universe. There were all these wonderful things happening then. Then there were the wilderness years with quantum mechanics coming to the fore, mathematics being too difficult, general relativity was put, um, was um, uh, uh, basically ignored or maligned by the physics community for over 25 years. 
And it was only in the late 50s, early 60s, that people started looking at general relativity again in detail. There were some papers throughout, but it was really something that people, and I could tell you more about why people didn't work on it. There's a, an interesting quote by Feynman in a meeting in 1957, where he says, said, there exists one serious difficulty, and that is the lack of experiments. And he's talking about general relativity. The best viewpoint is to pretend that there are experiments and calculate. In this field, we are not pushed by experiments, but pulled by imagination. And that was the fundamental problem with general relativity. It was very hard to measure things. Of course, the 1960s, we saw this tremendous revival. Um, the radio astronomers discovered quasars. Quasars were incredibly energetic objects at, very, at large distances, which means that they were strong gravity. The only way to explain them was through general relativity. There was the prediction and discovery of the cosmic microwave background. There were multiple ways of looking at black holes from looking at the effects it had on, their, on, on partners, looking at X-ray emission, Penrose came up with the singularity theorems, um, uh, saying that black holes were inevitable if you if you um, um, if you believe in general relativity. Um, there was the emergence of physical cosmology, which I think has been at the heart of what you've been learning last week and this week. In other words, that not only do we look at the expansion of the universe, we have to look at the large scale structure of the universe. And we this really was the golden age of general relativity. And we fast forward to now, and it really is a glorious time to think about general relativity. It, cosmo, cosmology, our current model of theory of cosmology is based on general relativity. The LIGO-Virgo detections are based on general relativity. Uh, the Sagittarius A star measurement of the black hole shadow is based on general, um, sorry, the, the orbits around Sagittarius A star are based on general relativity, the event horizon, time, et cetera. There are all these wonderful observations that come which are consistent with general relativity. And what, what do I mean by general relativity? Well, sometimes it's useful just to compare um, with what we believe gravity was for, for hundreds of years. In, with Newton, we came, we had a theory of gravity which gave us F equals MA, and it told us how this F, this force due to gravity, was generated by um, um, by the energy density, by, by mass. And so here we have the simplest formulation of F equals MA, and this F is given by the gradient of some potential, and this potential is sourced, sourced by an energy density. With Einstein, what we talk about is geodesics in space-time, and so this is a clumsy way of writing the geodesic equation. This is built out of this thing, the Christoffel symbol, which we, which comes from the metric. And the metric is the thing that de defines the geometry of space-time. The, the metric also feeds into the Einstein tensor, which is built out of the, the Ricci curvature, uh, tens the Ricci tensor and the Ricci scalar. And this is sourced by the energy momentum and the cosmological constant. And so this is how we do general relativity. And the link between the two is we if we take the appropriate limit, if we look at the weak field non-relativistic limit, we have that the G naught naught component it gives one plus two phi, this, the, 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 the Newtonian potential. And so this equation basically reduces down to this thing here, over here. And the field equations reduce down to this over here. So this is how we map one from the other. Um, note that there are some interesting properties. The, um, the gradient of the, 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 uh, this, the Einstein tensor is divergence free, but that also corresponds to conservation of energy and momentum. And also that um, uh, these equations are second order in the metric. Okay. So another way of looking at, at, at general relativity is by looking at the action. And the action for general relativity is the Einstein-Hilbert action, which I've written here. So here is the Planck mass, and sometimes we write uh, the action in terms of the Planck mass, sometimes we write it in terms of Newton's constant. And we have here the Ricci scalar minus two lambda over here, and then we have the coupling to matter, and the coupling is via G, it's just minimal coupling to matter. And how do we get, how do we go back to the, the Einstein equations? Well, we vary with regards to the metric. And so if we vary all this, if we do a, a, um, a, a use variational calculus to expand this, we get the delta S will be um, all this junk over here where we get, what is this? This is just the G alpha beta plus lambda G alpha beta. This is the Einstein tensor plus the, sorry, the cosmological constant term. Here we have the energy momentum tensor. So we have here all bundled together in front of G alpha beta, we have the, uh, we have the Einstein field equations. We get an extra bit over here which are surface terms, but these 
um, we, we, uh, these depend on the boundary and we just have to set the right boundary con uh, conditions to, to set this to zero. And there's a whole discussion in the 1970s of why this should be here, why this shouldn't be here. The reason I'm putting this here is this is going to be important when we look at other theories. Okay. And tests, well, there are all these tests that you've learned in your undergraduate degree. You've learned about gravitational redshift, and this was spectacularly measured by pound, uh, um, in the pound red kick experiment that you have, uh, you have a, 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 an element in, in emitting, uh, having emission lines at some frequency high up in a gravitational potential. You measure it low down, you'll get a gravitational shift, which is due to the difference in the, the value of the gravitational potential between those two points. Um, you can look at orbits, and we know that we've measured the per precession of perihelion with mer Mercury. We can look at lensing. Um, we've seen that with, with the Eclipse ex expedition by Eddington and others. We can look at orbits, one of the most spectacular measurements of... Uh, uh, we can look at one of the most spectacular constraints on general relativity comes from looking at the time delay as an emitter moves behind a massive object. Uh, it's known as the Shapiro time delay, and it's been spectacularly measured by the Cassini satellite. But of course, we have all these other new, new set of measurements like the binary pulsars. The binary pulsars, you can measure the orbits in almost strong gravity, and you can see them, how, how they evolve, and you can see how the general relativistic corrections come in with exquisite precision. More recently, we've looked at gravitational waves, and by looking at how black holes merge and um, in spiral merge and ring down and looking at the consistency between the in spiral and the ring down how it's consistent with general relativity it's not of such a good test but it, you know it's the new, it's the first time we're doing tests in these regimes so we could i could just list out an end there's an endless list of, of um ways of of testing general relativity which seems to pass um which general relativity seems to pass now, why, why, what is the theoretical reason why we believe general relativity? Well, if you're a relativist, there's this very beautiful theorem by Lovelock, which says that if you want to construct an action with a metric, which is local, four-dimensional, has second-order equations of motion, um, um, it, it, the only th action that we can construct is the Einstein-Hilbert action. So it's kind of a uniqueness proof that if we want these properties, which is locality, we live in a four-dimensional space, we want second-order equations of motion, and I will mention this again later on, um, that the, you, it has to be the Einstein-Hilbert action. And this is what, you know, uh, relativists, this is the kind of relativist's argument. There is the particle physicist's argument, which I just want to go over briefly because it's the kind of thing that people who work in particle physicists will invoke in one form or another, is that the Einstein action Hilbert action is the only consistent theory of a spin two field. And the, I put down the references there because they're, they're educationally, they're useful for you. I've also put down a paper by Padmanabhan, which contests this view. And again, I think it's useful to, to read it because he points out possible loopholes in, the, in, in this idea. But let me try and explain what is meant by this, this consistent theory. So let's imagine that we have a spin two field. And what I mean by a spin two field is really a field with two indices, okay? And let's assume that this spin two field satisfies a gauge symmetry. In other words, we can choose a four vector, psi mu, okay? And if we transform this field by a gradient of a del, um, del mu psi mu plus del mu psi mu, and we just add that to it, and we transform the equations of motion that this field satisfies or the action that this field satisfies, it's invariant. So I want to construct a theory which is invariant under this transformation. I'm calling it a gauge symmetry um, for this spin two field. Now, where could this symmetry come from? Well, there's a really easy way of, of, of seeing this. Suppose we have two metrics, okay, and we take each metric and we expand it around Minkowski space, okay? So we have Minkowski space plus this spin two field, and we have it on both sides, all right? And then we do a, uh, a, an arbitrary uh, uh, coordinate transformation, but what we do is we linearly expand this coordinate transformation. And if we linearly expand this coordinate transformation, it's simply gonna have this small uh, 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 expansion around the original value, okay? And if you replace these two things here and keep to linear order, we are going to get this transformation. So what you can think of is this gauge symmetry is nothing more than linear, linearized diffeomorphism invariance or linearized co coordinate uh, transformations, okay? 
So this is the transformation. I want to construct an action which is invariant under that transformation. And it's very simple to do. And Fears uh, and Pauli did this um, in the 1930s. This is the action which satisfies that, that symmetry. You have here the, the two index, and you have to add in all these terms with a minus a half here, a plus a half here, a minus one here, and plus a half here, okay? So minus a half here, plus one here, minus one here, plus a half here. And the key thing is it's, the indices are all contracted in different ways. Now, one thing you could do is you could have just written down an arbitrary action with constants here, contracting all the indices in different ways, and then impose that transformation and find the action which um, satisfied that. That's a good homework exercise that you might want to do. Now, if you vary this action, uh, you'll get an equation of motion for the, for the spin two field. And if you pick a gauge, and I'm gonna pick the transverse and traceless gauge, this is what it looks like. So this is the evolution equation for a field for this action. The problem with this is it has no source. So if you add a source, and we know that gravity really is all about sources. You know, you've got a space time, you put stuff in it, it'll deform the space time. So we need an equation where you, uh, you, you'll modify this, this, this spin two field somehow by the presence of something. Let's keep it simple. Let's just add a scalar field, a massless scalar field. Suppose we just add a bit to the action, which is just add um, uh, 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 a new bit to the action. So it's this plus this. What are the equations of motion? Well, the equations of motion are simply going to be the same one we had before, plus the massless Klein-Gordon field, and they're uncoupled. The, the, the spin two field is completely unsourced by the scalar field. We need to some, find some way of sourcing this bit by this bit over here. In other words, what we'd like is we'd like a, a, an evolution equation where the scalar field, where the spin two field would be sourced by the stress energy tensor of the scalar field. And the stress energy tensor looks something like that. Well, we can add something like that. If we add a term just like that, we do that and then work out the equations of motion, we find an inconsistency. And again, I could leave this as a homework exercise. We would get that this is equal to this, but we know that this, um, we, what we find is that this thing is equal to zero, but this thing isn't equal to zero. And this thing isn't equal to zero because now this box term is sourced by this thing over here. In other words, it's inconsistent. And why isn't it inconsistent? It's inconsistent because gravity has self, the graviton has self energy. And so then you can do an exercise, which is, well, let's construct an energy momentum tensor for the gravitational field and just add this to this, this action over here. And if you add that again, what you find is that the energy the, the evolution equation for the spin two field lo doesn't look like what we want, which is uh, uh, sourced by the energy momentum tensor of the phi field and the H. And you can keep on doing this. You can you add in a term which is quadratic, you add in a term which is cubic, you add in a term which is quartic, you keep on adding terms. And it's only when you've iteratively added terms to make the action consistent, you find that you recover exactly the Einstein-Hilbert action. So this is a really clunky proof that you, you and but you can show that the only way to make this argument self-consistent is if this action is highly nonlinear and it's the Einstein-Hilbert action. Now, you could ask why aren't there higher derivatives? So, for example, you can ask we've only got um, second-order derivatives in the action uh, in the Einstein-Hilbert action. Why couldn't we consider higher derivatives? And I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tangent and consider um, a paper by a kind of overlooked paper by, from 1967 by Andrei Sakharov. And he did a very interesting exercise. He basically, he constructed the action of a scalar field, okay, free scalar field on a curved background. So here's the metric. So this is the action, but didn't give the metric any dynamics, okay? So you can almost think of this as space time as this inert rubber sheet and you're just putting the, um, the, 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 the scalar field on this action. But he says the action is a function of phi and g alpha beta. Then he did the following interesting thing. He integrated out in the sense of a path integral, he integrated out the scalar field. And if you integrate out the scalar field in this way, you end up with an effective action for g alpha beta. And what's really interesting is you generate a series of terms. And this is the effective action that you generate. You would generate a cosmological constant, you will generate the Einstein-Hilbert term, but you also generate all these higher order contractions of the Ricci tensor, okay? And this just goes on and on and on. So you could ask yourself, why are we just limiting ourselves to this over here? Well, 
the one uh, first thing to look at, a first thing to consider is that um, do these terms actually matter? So let's just restrict, restrict ourselves to this term here and this term here. And let's do something very simple. Let's factor out m Planck squared over 2r in front of everything, okay? We then end up with 1 plus a2 over r over m Planck. Now, this term will only be interesting or useful when r is of order m Planck. We assume that all these constants are of order 1. But it, it, this, this is only of order 1. This is only comparable to the, to the Einstein-Hilbert term if this is of order 1. But that's in an incredibly extreme regime. We never, we're never in, in, in any um, situation in which we're, we're, we're confronted with in this regime, except maybe uh, in quantum gravity, the curvature is never of order the Planck mass. So that's why we never have to worry about these higher order terms. There's another aspect, which is if you add higher order derivatives to your equations of motion, and you'll definitely do that because remember, there's second order derivatives here, but here you have second order and second order, you go to fourth order and et cetera. You introduce instabilities. These are known as the Ostrogratsky instabilities, which are in general unavoidable and you do not want your equations of physics to, to be unstable. So, um, that's why, and so this is kind of a, this is a, a kind of almost a PR piece on why we should um, stick with GR. It's, it's GR is the leading order for, for gravity. It's beautifully confined, uh, confirmed by, by experiments. There's, there's theoretical prejudice. Love, you know, Lovelock's theorem shows that there's, if you make certain assumptions, that there's a uniqueness um, about it. There's theoretical prejudice from the field theory point of view, that if you try and construct the, the your consistent theory of a spin two particle, and, and we've been very good at constructing a, a consistent theory of a spin one particle, it's Yang-Mills, or spin zero particles, it's the Higgs particle. If you want to do the same thing for a spin two particle, you end up with general relativity. And high derivatives are suppressor unstable. But in, in doing all this, we, we, we have, you know, in doing all this, we've made assumptions. And sometimes it is these assumptions that give us a way of exploring other options. And that's what I'm going to move on to next. But before I do that, I am going to take questions. Okay, so I'm going to look at uh, why don't we also speak of isotropy violations? We could speak of isotropy violations. Isot isotropy is incredibly well constrained, although, as you will point out, there have been these recent measurements that there are some is isotropy violations um, uh, by some of my colleagues have found isotropy violations in some of the large scale structure data. Um, pure anisotropy uh, is described by models called Bianchi models. They are, they are beautiful models. They're not particularly interesting from the point of view of solving the problem, the problems, uh, uh, the dark energy problem, or the dark matter problem, but they're interesting in their own right. And there's a whole literature on constraining them. Okay, what about the possible mass term for the graviton in the Pauli action? The mass term could be there, but that's not what I, I don't need it for the point that I wanted to make here. Uh, the, the, the question is, could there be a mass term? There could be a mass term. That mass term um, it, it has led to a whole other field of research in modified theories of gravity. I'm not going to go into that. Um, can you explain, please, how Ostrogratsky instabilities will appear with higher derivative terms? No, I can't. And I'm really sorry because I used to have that and it would take me about 15 or 20 minutes to do that. Um, but the point being that if you add higher derivative terms and you and um, so if you have an action and you had higher derivative terms and you try to construct um, the Hamiltonian for this theory, what you find is that you get linear terms in the in the momentum. And if you have linear terms in the momentum, this means that when the momentum goes negative, the energy goes negative. And if the energy goes negative, the system is completely unstable. So that is in a nutshell, what is the problem with Ostrogratsky instabilities? But I can point you to, in, in, if you look at the, the um, my, my, my transparencies and you look at the, uh, I have a reference there to a paper by Woodard who really explains it in beautiful detail. So I recommend you go and look at, at, at it there. Hi, in the last, argument on the appearing EFT term, was it fair to assume A1 to be of order one? Well, that's the, the typical assumption that one makes is that the coefficients in front of these terms are of order one. So that's the standard assumption in, in, in. I note that I wasn't using an EFT argument. I was just basically doing a um, calculating an effective action. And, and when you do these effective action uh, uh, terms, they typically, typically are of order one. 
I'm not going to answer this Pauli uh, uh, Fears term because I think it goes a little bit off, off, off topic. Okay. Right. So I've told you why we shouldn't modify GR. I am now going to discuss why, how we can modify GR. Again, you like this full screen, so let me try and get this right. Full screen. And now... Okay, so why, why should we modify GR? Well, we all know that gravity is unlike the other forces. It just doesn't fit neatly into the, into, into the package that we have. It's not, you know, the strong, weak, and electro forces are in common parlance, UV complete. Um, we have a unified model for them. There are things that we don't understand in it, but you know, it's a pretty spectacular theory. Gravity does not fit into this unification picture. Um, furthermore, it's not uni UV complete. It is just, if you want to be dismissive, an effective field theory. Um, and you would like to understand why, you know, what goes beyond that effective field theory. Furthermore, there are these interesting low end within gravity itself. There's this interesting and puzzling hierarchy. We we seem to need this cosmological constant, which is part of gravity, um, but we also have the Planck mass. And if we work out the corresponding energy densities to both of these terms, there's a discrepancy of about 120 orders of magnitude. Um, there's an interesting aspect, which I think has motivated many, many attempts to look at beyond general relativity, which is an argument made by others, Eddington and others, but I like Dirac's version. And he, his argument is the following. If we work out the mass contained in the cosmological horizon, and we work out the size of the cosmological horizon, we roughly get the value of Newton's constant. And so an, a way of converting that into something more dynamical or to do with, I mean, this is a coincidence, you know, this is a coincidence that one might try to try, uh, try to explain. Um, if we try and, 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 and see what this, where this might lead us, a la Dirac, well, what if we say that this, this mass contained in this cosmological horizon is simply some density times r cubed, you know, there are factors of order one in front, and we replace it in that inequality here, in that sim here, and we replace it and we get something like this, and then we try to covariantize this equation. Well, we get something like this, and what this seems to be implying is that Newton's constant should be dynamical. In other words, Newton's constant could respond to the environment to take the value it has to satisfy this. So this is kind of a hint that maybe there is something going on which is just beyond general relativity and that there's some kind of adjustment going on uh, which, is, which leads to the coincidences that we see today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use what I spoke about in this, the, when I was trying to convince you that GR was the, was the theory. And I'm going to go back to Lovelock's theorem. And if you remember Lovelock's theorem, Lovelock's theorem uh, imposed three conditions. He said that um, we wanted a theory that was local, that was metric, um, that was second order. And I've, we want it to be second order because we don't want to go down the Ostrogradsky instability route. And we, we live in a four dimensional space time. Let's stick to these things. If we stick to these things, it's pretty hard to, to go beyond. But what if we start violating some of these assumptions? And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a first proposal, which is I would consider is the Ur example of, um, of the modified gravity theory. And it's Jordan Brand's Dickey gravity. And throughout my lectures, I will use this as a model of how things happen, how one might study modified gravity, how one might go beyond lambda CDM. And this was a, a theory that was proposed in, in the early 1960s by Jordan, Brands and Dickey. I just put the reference here to the Brands and Dickey paper, which I think is a very clear paper. And let me just talk you through it. So this is the action and it looks just like the Einstein-Hilbert action. We've got the minus root G here, but now instead of the, the Newton's constant, we have a, a field here, a phi. And because we have this phi field here in front, we have to add in a kinetic term. And it's a little bit odd as a kinetic term because we have to divide by phi to make it dimensionally consistent. And there's this one free parameter and this re-parameter is dimensionless, okay? And then gravity, 
So now, how, what, what, how are we breaking love locks theorem? We're breaking love locks theorem because we have a metric in the scalar field. It's not just a metric, okay? And the matter is coupled solely to the metric, okay? It has this one parameter. And note, if we send this parameter to infinity, well, if you look at this term, as you send this parameter in, to infinity, we can infer immediately from this that this will be pushed to zero, okay? We're gonna freeze this term. But if we freeze this term, it means that phi is a constant. And if phi is a constant, it means that the phi in front of the R, the Newton's, Newton's constant is a constant. And so we just recover general relativity, okay? What do the field equations look like? Well, the field equations look like this. We have g mu nu here, and then we have what is effectively the energy density of the, the, the scalar field here, uh, the, the, the energy momentum density of the scalar field here. But we get these extra terms, and these extra terms are nothing more than that boundary term that I told you to ignore when I was looking at the Einstein-Hilbert action. Now, because we have this phi field, we pick up some dynamics from here. And this is all sourced by the energy momentum tensor. So we find that these are the modified field equations. They look like this. We also have a, 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 a field equation for the scalar field. And the scalar field now looks like this. And look, this is now box phi and is sourced by the energy momentum tensor. And so this is very much like the idea that um, uh, uh, um, Dirac comes out of Dirac's just hand waving argument of the of the scalar field being sourced by the energy momentum by by the by the energy density. Okay, so we seem to be picking up the kind of features that we might want if we wanted to satisfy Dirac. But it doesn't matter. This is just a simple model. So just to recap, your scalar field now is one over the Newton's constant. It's, it's kind of a, a time, it's a spatial and time evolving Planck mass. The boundary terms are now important and they give you terms which are second order in phi. There's an additional source for the energy momentum tensor as I showed you, the energy momentum tensor now, you have to include the energy momentum tensor of the scalar field. And the scalar field is sourced by rho plus three P. Okay, remember it was the trace of the energy momentum tensor. Now, uh, if you take the Newtonian limit, the Newtonian limit, um, you'll find that your is, is set by the, 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 the rest mass or the rest value of the scalar field plus some dependence on, on the, on the uh, what you call it, on the, on the parameter. And there are fantastic constraints on this parameter. I mentioned the time delay, the Shapiro time delay from the, 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 the Cassini satellite. We can now constrain this dimensionless parameter to be greater than four times 10 to the four. OK, and remember what that means. That means that when we push that to infinity, we're freezing this. So phi is cl very close to a constant. So this theory, as it stands, is remarkably close to general relativity. We can take the general relativistic limit and we can uh, uh, and, it, and, and, and we look we can look at the data and it's pushing it to the general relativistic limit. So I'm going to come back to this theory again and again through the lectures, because I think it's just a very useful theory because of the, everything that happens um, to, 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 to use as a, 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 as a test case, an educational model, but also as a model of how we should look at data. Now, we can also use this theory to, to learn a little bit about how, what we can do with such theories. We can make this theory like general relativity, okay? And what we're gonna do here is what we're going to, transform the metric. We're going to do what's known as a conformal transformation. We're going to take this metric and we're going to multiply it by some field phi, okay? And if we multiply it by this field, um, psi, sorry, psi, um, one of the things is if you plug that into the expression for your Ricci scalar, it's going to pick up these psi squared and a psi, a log, uh, 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 Nabla, um, Dalembertian of log psi here. It's going to pick up these things. And we can go back to our um, uh, 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 Jordan Brands Dickey theory and replace R G and R here by this new this new G. So this G I'm transforming into a new G multiplied by this psi. And what we get is something that looks like this. Okay. So we had the phi here was already here, but now we're going to have psi from this, psi from here. This thing is going to generate terms like this, which are going to come over here. And we just plug it all in. And what you're going to find is that your, ah, I'm sorry about that. What you're going to find is that your transformed, your conformally transformed Jordan Brand uh, uh, uh action looks like this. And then we can do something magical. We can make this look 
like general relativity. And so what we do is we say, oh, this is simply M the Planck mass squared over two. And that then tells us what psi is. So we now have psi in terms of phi, okay? And so wherever we have a psi now, we can replace it by um, uh, M Planck squared over two psi. I'm sorry, uh, we can replace it by um, phi over M Planck squared over two. And we do all that. And then we can do another transformation. We can redefine phi as e to something times a scalar field, a new scalar field alpha, okay? So let me recap. What I've done is I've defined a new metric G. And so I have that the old metric G mu nu is psi to times this new metric. I plug it into R and I calculate my new Ricci tensor. I plug it into all of, into the action. I replace everything. And so I now have a psi and a phi there. I now want to make this look like general relativity. And so I have an M Planck mass squared over two. And so I can define my psi in terms of phi. I get this. And I do one final step, which is define phi in terms of the scalar field, okay? And, and psi is some exponential of a scalar field. And what I end up is, as promised, something that looks just like GR. What I now have is just the Einstein-Hilbert uh, action with a massless scalar field. But look what's happened. What I now have is that matter is not minimally coupled to the metric anymore. It now is coupled to G times alpha, and there's an alpha in front here. So I now have Einstein Hilbert here, but I have non-minimally minim, coupling, non-minimal coupling to the scalar field alpha, which I remind you is just another way of writing phi. Now, this is important because this lets me show you what is one of the key properties that keeps on coming up when you try to modify gravity, which is a fifth force. Now, what is a fifth force? We call it a fifth force because it, which is a force which is beyond, it's not the classical Newtonian force, it's not the strong force, the weak force, or the, uh, um, the electromagnetic force. And why is it a fifth force? It's a fifth force because let's look at a relativistic particle. This is a, the action for a relativistic particle, okay? And I replaced this g mu nu here, so it's g mu nu dotted in with x2 to x dots. I mean, you've, you've probably done this in your classical mechanics. You replace this here now by psi g mu nu, right? We've done this transformation into to this new metric, okay? And then we can go away and work out the geodesic equations for this. This is one way of doing, of figuring out the geodesic equation is just working out, doing the, the Euler-Lagrange equations for this. And if you do this, what you find is you get the normal geodesic equation here. And if you remember in GR, this was equal to zero, but now we have that it's proportional to delta to some gradient of this psi field. Okay, plus some terms over here that I'm not going to work about. And this is nothing more than a force. So we basically have an acceleration which is driven by a force. And this is the fifth force. So the point of this is to show you that this fifth force can, that um, going in the Einstein frame, adding this modification to gravity is nothing more than adding in this new fifth force. And there's going to be an equation of motion for this, which will tell you how this for fifth force responds to, to, to stuff. Okay, how am I doing for time? I can't see a clock. Oh, I can see a clock. I'm going to take another two more minutes. Um, a few more minutes. I'm going to take a few more minutes. Okay. Okay. So I, 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 I introduced you to um, Jordan Brand's Dickey theory. And Jordan Brand's Dickey theory, I, I consider the simplest case of a modified theory of gravity. You add a scalar field as, a, as part of the gravitational dynamics. And... Um, Suppose we wanted to generalize this. Suppose we want to, uh, uh, we re let's restrict ourselves to second order equations of motion as before, but suppose we want to generalize this um, to uh, um, beyond just Jordan Brand's Dickey. Well, there are many ways of doing this. One way is, is by generalizing the kinetic term. And so often we, and we'll come through this again and again, we often like to call capital X is just the normal kinetic term. And the normal action we have with a scalar field, we just have a normal kinetic term, but we could add in a function of the kinetic term that looks like this. Um, we could add in more complex non-minimal couplings between the scalar field and, and, the, uh, and the Einstein Hilbert and the, uh, the Ricci scalar. So we could add in a function of phi. We could add in potentials. We could do all of this and just make far more complicated models. Um, there's an interesting aspect that I, I, I want to bring you to, which is, you know, we, we, want to, we want equations to be second order, but there are ways of making equations second order, even though when you look at the action, it looks like fourth order. And I, I find this a really 
good toy example of how you would do this. So this is a flat case example. So I, as you've seen, I've, I've dropped the square root of, of g here, but let's construct, let's add these two terms. Let's look at this action, okay? Now in principle, this is a nightmare, right? Because I've in, I'm, in principle, I have here fourth order equations of motion, okay? I, I've got explicitly fourth order equations of motion here. I here I have the product of two second order equations of motion, two second order, sorry. I've got a fourth order term here. I've got the product of two second order terms here. All of this you would imagine will give you fourth order equations of motion. Well, you can sit down and just vary this with regards to phi. And I leave this as an exercise. Um, if you vary this, you're going to pick up these terms. And I bundle them in the following way. I bundle them in a way where you have the um, fourth order terms are here. Okay. And the sec and I, I put that here, and a second order term is here. All right. And the trick that you can do is you can integrate by parts. Um, uh, you can integrate by parts this bit over here. And then what you can do is you can set lambda equals to two to get rid of all the fourth order parts that you would obtain from here. And if you do this, this action reduces to something that looks like this. In other words, you could write this this way. And if you put two here, if you put the number two here, your equation, even though this looks like a, a fourth order equation of motion, you would get fourth order equations of motion. You can end up with second order equations of motion. Now you can do this, uh, trick very systematically. And that's in fact what was done in 2009 by Nicolas and collaborators. You can construct a very general action with all possible contractions of um, uh, 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 um, d'Alembertians of phi and d'Alembertians and d'Alembertians, and you can tune the terms so perfectly that you only get second order uh, equations of motion. And what you find is that these theories have a particular symmetry. It's called the Galilean symmetry, which I write here. You can shift them and you can add a, a, a space time dependent shift. But you can, the point being is you can generalize um, scalar field actions. Uh, uh, quite trivially to, 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 to give them second order equations of motion. And in fact, you can do this even further. And this is something that you'll come across if you look at beyond lambda CDM theories. And that is that you can construct what are known as Horndesky actions. So let me just talk you through what this action looks like. You have the, this should be D4, X, I'm sorry, minus root G. And then you have a sum of five terms. And these terms are, fun these, these are general functions of phi X, the, the um, D'Alembertian of phi and the metric, okay? And it turns out that if you restrict this to having second order equations of motion, the, these, these, these have a very simple form. You basic, your L2 is simply a K of a, 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 a function of X and phi. This L3 is some function of X and, and phi times box phi. L4 is a G, you have a function here of X and phi um, times the, the Ricci curvature plus this thing here to compensate. And then you get an, an additional bit. You can add a bit which is proportional to the Einstein tensor contracted with, um, with the scalar field and an extra bit here. And it turns out that this mess over here will give you only give you second order equations of motion. So this is a very general action that gives you second order equations of motion. It is not the most general action. And over the last few years, we've learned that there are ways of generalizing even further. And I would point you to papers on beyond Horndesky action and doses. But the, the, just to finish this part of, the, of, of my lectures, the point about this is there are ways of generalizing, um, of, of constructing, constructing um, modifications of gravity which behave well and which you can do systematically and which give you second order equations of motion. And what I've really focused on here is uh, uh, just adding one extra degree of freedom, a scalar field. So breaking Lovelock's ass assumption of having just a metric, I've added a scalar field. Uh, uh, and I discussed the archetypal theory, which is Jordan Brand's Dickey theory. I've shown that the, the kind of the hallmark, the observational hallmark of this is that you now have a new force, a fifth force. Um, I've shown that in the in the case of Jordan Brand's Dickey series, they're, they're tightly constrained, but I've shown you how to generalize this. And I've gone a first step and shown how to generalize this to theories which look like an immense zoo, but still obey um, second order equations of motion. So I think for today, I will stop here and I will now look at the questions um, that have come up in the chat. Uh, so um, Gabriel asks, are there any, have I, let me unshare screen. 
uh, have I answered I've answered, I've answered, okay. Are there any other constraints other than the Shapiro time delay on W, for example, like from the CMB? Constraints from the CMB are, um, if you look, I, 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 will, I will mention that actually, it's very good that you've said that. I will talk about constraints from large scale structure in one of my lectures. Constraints from the CMB are not yet uh, as competitive as the Shapiro time delay. There are phenomenal constraints from a binary pulse size. Um, it is, I, I, I didn't want to go into that, but the, in fact, the, the, the binary pulsars now have comparable constraints to, to those of the CMB, of, of those from uh, Shapiro time de, de, delay. All these, are all these new actions will be of fourth order. Um, I'm not completely sure what you mean by this. I think you're meaning how many derivatives will appear in the action. My guess, is, um, uh, 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 no, you will have higher derivatives. You can get higher derivative terms in the, you can get six uh, derivatives in the action. I will double check that, but I think the Hondesky action has higher derivative terms and has six order derivatives. What is the nature of this fifth force? Is it fundamental? Um, well, I think I showed you what the nature of this fifth force. It's a manifestation of this, this uh, scalar field that you put in the action. So to the extent that you're putting an action uh, a field into the action, it is a fundamental fifth force. How do you choose the expression of phi? Hang on, I'm gonna lose this thread if you keep on asking too many questions. How did you choose the expression of phi in the function of the scalar field alpha? Well, you, I chose it exactly to make the kinetic term a canonical kinetic term. What does the field psi mean physically? The field psi is simply a calculational trick to reduce the, the action to an Einstein-Hilbert action. Uh, lambda was chosen, so now we go to the Galilean case. Lambda was chosen to be two to keep the equations at second order. Does this guarantee the perturbation equation to be second order two? Yes, it does. Uh, instabilities as Ostergratsky is known today as ghosts? No, ghosts are something else. Ghosts are if you have ne a negative kinetic energy terms. When we add a coupling next to the Palfius, why exactly that? I don't understand that question, I'm, I'm sorry. How do we construct the Horndesky action? Well, you construct the Horndesky action basically doing what I did for the Galileon in flat space, but doing it in a covariant way. I would suggest you go and look at the references in the papers that I pointed to, because those papers are exactly about how they're constructed. Sorry, the fifth force would enhance the strength of gravity and then for enhanced structure formation. What about the consequences for photon geodesics? I will get into that um, in my lectures on large scale structure and how we use that to test modified gravity. Suppose that the weak field approximation of GR is taken around to sit a space time instead of Minkowski. How does lambda term will contribute to the gravitational wave equation? Um, it will contribute. It will contribute very minimally because, as you know, as you know, lambda is very small. Uh, I, a more interesting exercise is if you look at solve for a black hole. Solve for a black hole in in a de Sitter space time, and what you get is the a Schwarzschild de Sitter metric. And then what you can do is compare the the, the contributions from the Schwarzschild from the, the matter bit, which is which goes as one over R squared, with the bit from the Schwarzschild for the de Sitter bit, which goes as lambda r. And what you'll see is that the lambda r becomes very dominant at large term large uh, distances, but the, the ratio between the lambda and the bit and the gm is so radical that uh, the contribution is in, in uh, very large distances. I Pedro, think we're again the time. Yes. Don't worry about the time because we have half an hour for the next. I, I don't have half an hour, unfortunately. Hi, um, can, can I ask a question? Yes. So uh, thanks for the fantastic talk. I think it's very nice that you point out the, the possible marginal evidence in the works claiming that there is a marginal evidence for the accelerated, accelerated expansion. So I think yes. that this is very important and thank you for pointing this out. Uh, very nice. Uh, can you just comment because I, 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 th I think I, I saw uh, recently that there is these discrepancies on the values of G for the Newton constant from different experiments. And I was wondering if, if you uh, impose modifications to gravity, do you, can, can you solve this tension in the, the values of G? Or is there some specific theory that you could uh, handle I, this? My guess, is you, my guess is you're talking about the difference in the eoc Walsh experiments between the two teams in the USA. Yes. Right? Uh -huh. Yes, but that's been a long-standing problem. And it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. So just to, to, for, for the audience, 
what you have is that you have um, two experiments which are basically doing the same kind of experiments, which are which is basically a torsion balance experiment to constrain G. Okay. And over the years and over the decades, these experiments have got better and better and better. And so the error bars have gone down and down and down. And what is remarkable is that the errors, the, the, the errors are, well, they're, 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 they're fine. I mean, they're all, I think they're of order 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three, but um, no, actually more, 10 to the minus four. But the discrepancy between the values of these two experiments is, um, is much greater than that. There's, there's a multi-sigma discrepancy between these two experiments. Now, um, no one is trying to explain that discrepancy um, through modifications of gravity. The discrepancy is so large, the discrepancy is so large that um, the, 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 most people believe that there is a systematic effect going in into one or, one or the, other, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the other experiments. Um, and it's really difficult to think of something which would modify gravity so strongly given all the other things that are happening, you know, the seismic environment, environment the laboratory environment, etc. So my answer is that I know of that people pay attention to, there is no attempt at explaining this discre discrepancy between these two experiments using modifications of gravity. Okay, thank, thanks very much. Right. Um, uh, Pedro. I, yes. Uh, I have a, a question. Uh, may I do now? Yes. Uh, lambda, the lambda term has a dimension of a mass squared, uh -huh. right? And then uh, I, I, I ask if, if lambda may be interpreted as, as giving mass to, to the gravity to the gravity, may you interpret in some way uh, in, in GR, uh, lambda being responsible by the mass of the gravity? I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I haven't done this in many years. I think if you take, if you do, if you do this, uh, you know, here's what I suggest you do. Take the Einstein-Hilbert action with the lambda and look at the quadratic action. And does it look like Theus Pauli? Right, because that's the massive graviton. So I would suggest you do that. And that would be an answer to your question. Okay, uh, but in this case, we should do the perturbation around the, around the, uh, uh, at the city space time, not around the Aminkovsk space time. You could do that. You can do that. I think if you look at the papers by, Kurt Hinterbickler, the more recent papers, they've been looking a lot at massive gravity around um, around a sit of space time. And you, you, I think those, that might answer your question. Okay, okay. I know that you can use, I know that you can use in the sit of space time, you can use the fact, you can use it to cancel certain degrees of freedom. Um, but I don't think, I don't know if you can look at it as a massive graviton. I don't remember if you can. Okay, let me try and catch up with the questions. How anyway, can we see? Super fair, we can leave this. I don't know, can you participate in the Q&A today or? As you, I mean, you know my personal circumstances, right? We're in lockdown here and I-, I uh, Yes, uh, so. so I, I think I, I will come to the Q&A at five. I, I will come to the Q&A at five. Yes, we, I, we agreed. Uh, for me, it's 5 p.m. For you, I don't know what time it's gonna be, but so. I will, I will, I will be at the Q and A. Yes. And there is also, I just want to remind people, there is also the uh, Slack channel. So there's a Beyond Lambda CDM specifically for Pedro's lectures. So you can also write your questions there, and uh, we, we will get to these questions during the Q and A. Is, is that fair, Pedro? I think that's fine. Yes, yes, yes. So when, so you can take um, as many questions as you want now, but we can leave some for the. Uh, for I think Slack. I've got five. I think I have five more minutes and then I, I'll, I'll have to go. Okay, go ahead. Um, 
how can we see that the metric is non-minimally coupled to the scale of field? And what does it mean really for gravity compared comparing to GR? Well, I, I mean, I, I show you, I showed you a derivation of that. Uh, I think you have to go go back to my transparency and look at that. Uh, I've also pointed you to the review that I wrote. Um, what does it mean really for gravity comparing to GR? Well, I, again, I, I pointed that out. It means that you get a fifth force. It seems that quintessence is equivalent to scale of fields scalar tensor series, which is equivalent to F of R. Am I missing something or is this, well, you have to be careful with what you're saying here. No, this isn't true. F of R, you can rewrite, and I will do this in the next, next lecture. I will show that it's equivalent to a scalar field, scalar tensor theory. A, um, so F of R is a scalar tensor theory. You can think of quintessence as a scalar tensor theory, but with uh, no non-minimal coupling, but you cannot say that quintessence is equivalent to F of R, right? Then, can we eliminate some terms of Horndesky Lagrangians based on observations? Which are the most relevant or the ones that survive? I will get that to you in my final lecture if we get there. Yes, we can. We can use the constraints from the GW170817 binary neutron star to radically simplify the Horndesky action. Uh, I think that's it. I think that's it. Great. I think we've run questions. Thank you very much, Pedro. And uh, thank you very much all the uh, participants for the questions. Don't forget to use the uh, Slack channel if you have more questions. And um, so we'll be back uh, in 24 minutes for uh, Chiara's lectures on gravitational waves. So thank you very much again, Pedro. Thank you, bye.